Okay, so the way I work is that I will go over the answer key I gave to my TA. Uh, you will have two weeks to submit in writing any complaints uh, you have. I will ask you to be specific, so you can, uh, it can be a handwritten note saying a question three, uh, the TA made an, an addition mistake or I provided eight elements, I only got six points. It needs to be something that's specific, it doesn't need to be pretty. So you can write it now on a piece of paper as I go over this, put that in your booklet, give me your booklet at uh, the end of the uh, lecture. Now, by saying that uh, two of you got 96%, so I believe that uh, the term test was eminently doable if you prepared a bit in advance. And uh, one instruction I gave the TA was to uh, give you points if you said the thing in your own words, but it had to be uh, reasonably accurate. If not, you typically got off the mark. Okay. So question number one, how do Ater and Pachel define tariffs, non-tariff barriers, the comparative advantage model and productionism? According to Sean Mulholland, which was one of the videos, what are the three main ways of addressing negative externalities? And I specify, list them and say a few words about each of them, such as how they are supposed to work and the problems inherent in their implementation. So all the definitions were taken straight from the textbook in that case, uh, specifically from the margins. Uh, to be honest, most of the questions were of that nature in the first part of uh, this course, but in the second part, uh, as you might notice in the textbook, there are less notes in the margins and some questions will be uh, more from the main text. So tariffs are taxes imposed on the goods and services imported into a country. So you said that you got one point, you said something along those lines that was not false, uh, you got half a point, and you were not penalized for writing something wrong. Non-tariff barriers are uh, restrictions on imports using means other than taxation, such as quotas, punitive inspection requirements, etc. So one point, one illustration was enough. The comparative advantage model proposes that a region or nation should specialize in the goods and services that it can produce more efficiently than others, specifically with lower opportunity costs. So there were three elements to that one, 1.5 points, and I really wanted half a point for opportunity costs. I mean, this is an economic concept for which there are no substitutes, and this I needed to see. So protectionism means something along the lines of protecting domestic industries by imposing penalties and restrictions on market exchanges between them. Malholin from the video said there are three ways to deal with that. So taxation, regulation, and property rights, one point each. And within those, uh, taxation will reduce the amount of production of whatever good is producing the externalities. So why do our governments always talk about uh, taxing carbon? Well, because they want to lower carbon emissions. The problem in that case is monitoring. So how do you know that people are actually declaring what it is that they do, or how can you make sure that they emit the amount that they say they emit, and these kinds of things. Okay, regulation typically refers to a te technology-specific methods. Now the benefits, the monitoring costs are low. You can visit a factory if there's a scrubber uh, installed on the, the smokestack, then obviously uh, as long as the thing is turned down, it will do its job. The problem is that it reduces incentive to find innovative ways to deal with problems. So if you get out of uh, trouble by having a scrubber and turning it on, there's obviously not any incentive to discover a completely different way of dealing with the problem that might actually be more creative and deliver more benefits for less costs. Now, restricting the quantity of goods of pollution produced, one point. The benefit, firms have incentive to find innovative ways to reduce pollution, half a point. And the problem is that in that case, the monitoring costs are high. Property rights. Property rights are well-defined, divisible, and defendable, half a point. Transaction costs are low. By assigning property rights, parties can negotiate to reduce the impact of the pollution. The benefit monitoring costs are small. Another benefit, all parties have incentive to come up with innovative solutions that do not reduce the negative impact on social welfare. So you could say that in your own words, obviously, and ask the TA to go easy on you on that one. Okay? 
Question two, what are the basic parameters in the perfect competition model? List and describe briefly the three main type of auctions. How do Ater and Pachel describe the amount cost over space for central place good? The figure is acceptable. How did cattle ranchers in the American West once identify their livestock? What technological solutions solve the tragedy of the commons or open access problem in this context? Okay, the parameters. Competition, large numbers of sellers and buyers. So you need both sellers and buyers. If you say large numbers of sellers, obviously we're missing one side of the intersection. Fairness, transactions are voluntary. The transaction partners are independent and of relatively equal power. Self-regulation, well, homo economicus, economic human. Maximize profits, minimize costs. Auctions I discussed in class. So this came from uh, the PowerPoint slides. You've got an English auction, a seal bid auction, and a Dutch auction. An English auction is the one you're probably most familiar with, one point. Bidders bid openly against each other in increments, and the item is sold to the highest bidder. So you start low, you ask people to raise their hand or to punch a keyboard or something, and the highest bidder uh, wins whatever was being uh, bidden over. Bid. Seal the bid auction, one point. Bidders submit private bids that are sealed and the item is sold to the highest bidder. So you typically okay. see that in uh, charity functions. The Dutch auction is the reverse of the English auction. You start high, you go low, and the first person that bids gets the goods. So the price is gradually decreased by decrement. Item is sold to the first bidder to accept that price. Demand over cost space. What I wanted was figure 1.2. So if you didn't get three points for figure 1.2 and you had everything, then uh, you've got grounds for complaint. Now, obviously, uh, I assume that the TA is not an idiot, and if you decide to complete this at the moment, uh, no, pretty sure I'll catch you on this. Uh, ranchers, uh, branding animals. And uh, the solution to the tragedy of open access in the American West, barbed wire. So one point, one point. Okay, question three. How do Waiter and Patchell define and time monopoly laws and greenfield investment, foreign direct investment, hierarchical subcontracting, entry advantage, special entry barriers, the seedbed hypothesis, hierarchical subcontracting was there twice, so obviously the team adjusted for that. Tier one suppliers and lateral subcontracting. So 10 point, one point each, and time monopoly laws. Again, this is straight from the textbook. So laws that prevent excessive corporate concentration in an industry and or unfair business practices. Greenfield investment. Investment in empty sites where entirely new facilities can be constructed. Foreign direct investment. Investment by multinational corporations in foreign countries in operation that they own and control. Entry advantages, advantages based on accumulated expertise that allow firms to establish operations in new regions. Spatial entry barriers, the cost and uncertainty that face uh, firms contemplating investment in a new region or country. Seedbed hypothesis argues, argues that new firms are typically located close to their founder's own place, typically where they have lived for a long time. Hierarchical subcontracting, contracting out to a limited number of important suppliers of key components, who in turn engage other suppliers to provide the good or service in question. Tier one suppliers, suppliers of key component to core firms in relational markets at the top of the hierarchy of suppliers, and lateral subcontracting, contracting out directly to all suppliers. Again, these were straight from the textbook uh, in the margin, so I went over this quickly, but you can check what you wrote against uh, what is written in your textbook. So how do Ater and Patchell distinguish between underemployed and unemployed workers? According to them, what are the main policy emphasis and impact concerns about structural and seasonal unemployment? And what are Micros and Brian Kaplan's key messages? And I was only asking one sentence for each. Again, from the textbook, unemployed out of a job but still seeking regular paid employment, underemployed, employed but whose job does not, do not provide the hours and income they need to support themselves and their family. Structural versus seasonal. So again, straight from the textbook. And what I wanted was the uh, difference here. So five point for those. Micro, don't follow your passion, but bring it with you. And Brian Kaplan, make progress, not work. You could see more. And again, you were never penalized for writing too much. But this is what I really wanted. Number five. 
What case study does Don Woodrow use to illustrate the problems inherent to economic isolation? What are the two things that he, he deems surprising about comparative advantage? How do Waiter and Patchell define opportunity cost, competitive advantage, incremental innovation, radical innovation, general purpose technologies, codified knowledge, and tacit knowledge? So uh, Boudreau was from the, uh, one of the videos that I showed you, whose link was provided on your syllabus. Problem of isolation, Tasmania. I know it's unfair, a number of you wrote a couple of paragraphs, I apologize for that, but really the key, I was trying to make things easy for you here, Tasmania. Two surprising things, uh, one, by rearranging who does what, more stuff is produced, and two, if you get better at something that benefits you, it also benefits another party, even though his or her ability to produce hasn't changed at all. Opportunity cost, competitive advantage, incremental innovation, radical innovation, all the others are straight from the textbook. So opportunity cost, the potential benefits that are lost when one alternative is chosen and the other rejected. Competitive advantage proposes that businesses and government should actively seek out and shape opportunities for specialization and trade. Incremental, relatively small, almost imperceptible impacts on productivity. Radical, large-scale impact on productivity. General purpose technology. Um, innovations that have an effect on uh, the whole of the economic life across different industrial sectors. Codified knowledge, something that can be communicated precisely through language or formulas, be they textbook, patents, or something along those lines. Tacit knowledge, well, it's like riding a bicycle. I mean, you know how to do it, but how do you explain that? So, knowledge that is acquired through observation, imitation, and end zone experience, and is difficult to communicate verbally, so 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Okay, again, straight from the textbook. How do Witter and Patchell define external economies of scale, urbanization economies, localization economies of scale, immobile economies, multiplier, branch plant, and negative externalities? And that was me then at the end. According to your professor, what industries this assembly line inspired, among other things, the assembly line in car manufacturing? So again, straight from the textbook, external economies of scale, reduction in average cost of production resulting from accessing external supply, Urbanization economies, reduction in average cost of production, resulting from location in urban agglomerations that provide diverse labor pool, amenities, economic and social infrastructure. So again, I asked the TA to go easy on you here. You didn't need the whole thing, but as long as you convey the ideas of the various benefits that come from being in a dense urban agglomeration. Localization economies of scale, reduction in average cost of production, resulting from location in agglomeration that related economic activities. The, the key here is related the same stuff. So competitors that do essentially the same thing as you do. Immobile economies are external economies that are available only when the firm concerned are in close proximity to one another. The multiplier, uh, an initial spread of growth in one activity generate growth in other activities. So if a branch plant opens in your town, people have more money to buy cars and the person who sells car can then get an additional haircut or go out to the restaurant more often, these types of things. Branch plant, the plant or factory that is owned and controlled by companies that offices elsewhere. Negative externalities, costs that fall on third party or the environment that were not taken into account in the decision made by market actors. And according to your professor, again, something that was only discussed in class, uh, meatpacking or something related to the killing and disassembly of animals. So you said meatpacking, you got your point. Uh, killing and taking apart animals, you should have gotten your point. Again, uh, you could use your own words for all those things. Okay, present concisely uh, Rosen's and company market typology, a figure is acceptable. According to Mulholland and others, what are the two main solutions to the tragedy of the commons? In his opinion, what are the two conditions that are likely to deliver a better outcome when dealing with problems of this kind? Okay, so uh, Rosen was figure 1.5 from uh, your textbook. So you got three points for the three things up here, 0.5 for each of those, one point for communicating these ideas. And the last one, examples, one point, and you can note I say be generous here. You know, one example was enough. You should not have lost point here if you had a general idea. Malolan on the main solutions to the tragedy of the commons. Uh, public ownership where the property is owned and administered by the government. I said I would accept public ownership only. Private ownership is the other approach. The two conditions, limiting access and ensuring that decision makers bear the costs of their actions. So 0.5, 0.5. 
Uh, the waiter and patch shall define the division of labor, the social division of labor, the spatial division of labor, economies of scale, economies of scope, variable cost, fixed cost, and sunk cost. Again, all concept that uh, you need to understand to get a grip over uh, what economic life is about. Division of labor, the allocation of specific jobs to different people, the social division of labor, the distribution of tasks among firms, the spatial division of labor uh, within places, across regions, across space. Economies of scale, reduction in average cost of production by increasing the scale of particular activities. So if you said the more you produce, the less producing a unit costs you, you should have gotten your point. Economies of scope, uh, reduction in average cost of production, but by using existing resources to perform different tasks in a range of product categories. Variable costs, costs that vary with the scale of activity. Fixed costs, costs that remain the same regardless of the scale of activity. So you build a factory, doesn't matter how much you use it. If you need to keep the light on, you need to keep the light, you need to keep the lights on. Some cost investment in physical capital and to some extent skilled labor force that are more or less fixed in place and cannot be easily moved. So again, it's one of those what asked the TA to go easy on them. Oh, do we turn Patchell? Almost done. How do we turn and Patchell summarize the starting point of an institutional perspective on economic geography? No, the figure is acceptable. When measuring global po uh, poverty, why is it not sufficient to convert consumption level by the market exchange? So this one came from one of your mandatory readings outside of the textbook. So the, uh, what I wanted really was figure 1.1. You needed all those little points. So 0.5 each for evolution, differentiation, embeddedness, 5.8 each for concepts and keywords, the ones that are inside. So technology is 0.5 and the keywords for technology are 0.5 and 1.5 for the shapes and arrows. So the arrows needed to be in the right direction, which honestly is not too difficult since they were just going both ways in each case. Okay, measuring global poverty. A key difficulty for measuring global poverty is that price levels are very different in different countries. So uh, a Fuji apple in one country will cost a lot less than a Fuji apple in another. For that reason, it is not sufficient to convert the consumption level of people in different countries simply by the market exchange rate. So if a Fuji apple costs you a, a, a dollar in Canada and it costs you 50 cents in the US, it's not enough to just say, well, how, how much in US dollar is that Canadian, how much is a Canadian dollar worth you need to compare uh, to adjust for differences in price levels between different countries? Two points straight from the readings, okay? So again, you've got two weeks to submit a formal request for a regrading if you think that he made a mistake or if you believe that what you expressed was the same idea using different words. Uh, but again, uh, two of you, I don't know if they're here today, got 96% uh, on their test. So yes, there was a lot to memorize and I told you that the first part would be kind of boring, but I think it was kind of doable. Now, this being said, uh, the course uh, grades generally followed a normal distribution. So if I had people at that end, I also had people at the other end. So in your case, I'm not quite sure what else I could have done. I mean, I gave you all the questions in advance. Most of them were straightforward from the textbook. So I don't think I was unfair to you. OK, any questions? Okay, so today we're discussing uh, governments and the nonprofit sector. Now, to be honest, the ideological perspective that I share on these topics is often not the same as the authors of the textbook, so I figured I would bring in additional information and perhaps raise a few counter arguments uh, that are not uh, in the textbook per se. But again, if you have questions, I don't expect you to agree with me or to agree with the authors, but simply to state, well, according to this perspective, what is that thing? Or according to that other perspective, what is that other thing? So while I might have an ax to grind, uh, the questions will be non-ideological and you simply uh, explain what a certain perspective on a particular issue is. You don't have to agree with it or not. I just want you to know the arguments on both sides. Okay, so what is the chapter on government about? 
Well, this is an economic geography course, so obviously what the authors are interested in is to explain how government intervene in economic life in general terms, and they then discuss more particularly how they intervene at the city, uh, regional, or national level. So they discuss tools, they cover a lot of material. If you, already, if you don't already have a background in economics, uh, this might be a lot of information, but what I will attempt to do today is to provide additional uh, context to what is discussed in the textbook and also hint at what uh, the questions will be. Okay, so for political theorists among you, uh, bear with me. This is a gross oversimplification, but basically you've got two conflicting views of government and although what follows is a bit of a caricature, uh, they can be associated with two English thinkers, among others. So, in Thomas Hobbes, uh, humans essentially live in an environment that is harsh, that is bad, they're mean to each other, the state comes in and brings some order to chaos. Whereas John Locke believed to the contrary that uh, people will do good things if they're left alone. So life, liberty, and property was kind of his motto. So you let people do their own things, you make sure that uh, the institutions are right, and he believes that the social outcome will be better than if the government tries to order people around. So this is something that I got online, which again is a bit of an oversimplification, but the way you look at government essentially, I believe goes back to the way you look at people. You believe that people, most people can take care of themselves, or do you believe that most people are kind of hopeless and someone needs to be in charge? Do you believe that people who are poor or, or not at the top of the social hierarchy uh, can get out of their bad situation on their own, or do you have the mama bear syndrome where you protect your cubs and everyone who wants to engage in market transaction with them is out there to, uh, to get them or to exploit them? and you just slash the people who have more resources than those that have less. So depending on how you view uh, these relationships, the capacity of people to cooperate or the capacity of people to be mean to each other typically in determines, or at least influences heavily, your view of government intervention. So again, at the risk of oversimplifying, Hobbes, Locke, and in that case, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau is added. So for one, man is evil. For the other one, man is good. Rousseau believed that man, uh, man is good, but society screws him over. So society makes people, good people, bad. Government is, according to Hobbes, needed to protect the public. Uh, government, according to Locke, should be tolerated to the extent that it delivers some public benefit. And Rousseau says the government is needed to enforce the social contract. So Hobbes believes that the government should be all-powerful. Government is a force for the good, should not be overthrown. Uh, Locke believes that uh, government should be conditional on the consent of the governed and can be overthrown if it becomes tyrannical. Uh, Rousseau believes that government can be arbitrary, so it can be good, it can be bad, you can overthrow it when it becomes bad. Sh power should be, in Hobbes' perspective, not shared, so uh, there are people who are better than others and who should be in charge. Uh, Locke believes that power should be decentralized, and the less power you have in the hands of a few people, the better off society is. And Rousseau essentially believed that it should be shared and direct. So representatives are not needed, but at the same time, he does not believe. Well, I mean, Rousseau's kind of, his perspective is a bit more complex here, but you've got the general idea. And then you've got people who are even more radical than Hobbes. Uh, for example, you have people who believe in complete uh, state control. At the other end, you have people who are more radical than Locke. So uh, Frédéric Bastia, a French economist, was one of those, early 19th century. So government is the great fiction through which everybody endeavors to live at the expense of everybody else. So some people believe that government is good. Bastia believes that, uh, no, government is there. You know, you complain, you want to get more, and but other people are doing the same. So it's not a beneficent entity, it's something that is there for the taking and various groups compete to reap the rewards or the benefits. Okay, so um, 
different views of government. So three videos here to go quickly. So one is a view that comes from the political left that uh, is very critical of people who believe that the less government is the better government. And a view from the right uh, from Margaret Thatcher who was a British politician, uh, was in power uh, from the late 70s to, uh, the late, uh, to the early 1990s, who represent this sort of neoliberal view that government is ultimately socially corrosive. Okay, let's hope this works. Scheduled maintenance, we do that. For the best selection on tires like Michelin, B Equipage, and Uniroyal, visit our website at activegreenross.com. There's no better place to buy your tires and service your vehicle than... In this iteration of 3-Minute Theory, we bring you a concept that you might not know by name, but have surely felt by its far-reaching effects. Neoliberalism. Simply, neoliberalism is the idea that society should be shaped by the free market and that the economy should be deregulated and privatized. Or even simpler, what works in the private sector will also work in the public sector. But it doesn't stop there. Neoliberalism also involves the idea that the public sector should not only follow the private sector's rules, but it should also subsidize the private sector, which we know is now owned by fewer and fewer global capitalists. While neoliberalism began to reach its current heights in the late 1970s, it has its roots in Enlightenment liberal humanism, or classical liberalism, the belief that people were free to live their lives without a great deal of interference from the government. So what does neoliberalism have to do with classical liberalism, and why does it matter? Well, neoliberalism isn't really new itself, but is a new take on classical liberalism. Neoliberalism uses the language and tenets of classical liberalism in ways that now benefit large corporate interests. For example, many of the tenets of liberalism were enacted in the name of equality, meaning that free market policies were supposed to allow people an equal chance into the marketplace. Under neoliberalism, however, the free market loses its ties to democratic ideals and instead allows corporate capitalists to open up previously unavailable markets. Basically, the free market becomes increasingly free for wealthy corporate capitalists and less free for everyone else. Although neoliberalism is a discourse that we cannot necessarily see, it has real material effects on many aspects of our lives. Let's take the American public education system as an example of how business interests have infiltrated public systems. In the past, public schools were set up to offer a free education to promote the liberal humanist ideas of liberty and equality. But with the rise of neoliberalism and in turn education reform movements, the lines between public and private education have been blurred. What we now see is heavy private investment from private individuals and corporations. In the name of liberty, neoliberals use the business-laden language of choice, free market, and deregulation to dismantle and then reconstruct public schools in a corporate image. This all happens through the use of language that sounds lovely and freeing, but ultimately doesn't prompt too many questions from the general public. As corporations take a stronghold in the public sector, we also see the reciprocal investment of public school dollars into private companies. Not familiar with the education system? That's okay, you don't have to look far to see neoliberalism at work. Remember, neoliberalism is everywhere and it isn't limited to one political party. It's both right and left and conservative and liberal, which makes it very hard to work against. So next time you hear a politician or CEO talking about the greater good, take a moment to wonder who's good. More often than not, the good being held up as liberty for all might really just be more money for some. Okay, so that's one perspective on neoliberalism. Um, now for another one. Now many of you are familiar with Margaret Thatcher, quick show of that. Okay, if you were not, uh, there was a British puppet show in the 1980s which sort of conveyed in a few funny sketches how she was perceived by people. So before I showed you a serious video, I thought I would show you something a bit light after the exam. Audrey, 
strange nuclear weapons. What the hell for? Have you tried the all-day breakfast? Oh. Look, we've got to face it. The world has fundamentally changed peacefully. But there must be a bad fight. I've managed to close another mental hospital. Oh, excellent, Norman. Excellent. Uh, how many does that leave? Uh, three. Good work, Norman. Pretty soon there won't be one left to put me in. <laughs> appearance at the, the English Chamber of Commons when she debates with people who don't share her ideological views. I give way to the Honourable Gentleman. There is no doubt that the Prime Minister has in many ways achieved substantial success. The yeah. Yeah. There, is, there is one statistic that I understand is not, however, challenging. And that is that over her 11 years, the gap between the richest 10% and the poorest 10% in this country has widened substantially. How can she say at the end of her chapter of British politics that she can justify many people in a constituency such as mine being relatively much poorer much less well housed and much less well provided than it was in 1979. Surely she accepts that is not a record that she or any Prime Minister can be proud of. Mr Speaker, all levels of income are better off than they were in 1979. But what the Honourable Member is saying is that he would rather the poor were poorer, provided the rich were less rich. That way you will never create the wealth for better social services as we have. And what a policy. Yes, he would rather have the poor poorer, provided the rich were less rich. That is a liberal policy. Yes, it came out. He didn't intend it to, but he did. Way to the, I give way to the honourable gentleman. I'm extremely, I'm extremely good. The, the, the Prime Minister is aware that uh, I detest every single one of her domestic policies and I've never had that. And I think that the Honourable Gentleman knows that I have the same contempt for his socialist policies as the people of East Europe who have experienced it. I think I must have hit the right nail on the head when I pointed out that the logic of those policies are they'd rather have the poor poorer. Once they start to talk about the gap, they'd rather the gap was that. <laughs> Down here. That. Not that. But that. So long as the gap is smaller, so long as the gap is smaller, they'd rather have the poor poorer. You do not create wealth and opportunity that way. You do not create a property-earning democracy that way. To the Honourable Gentleman. I'm most grateful to the Prime Minister. Will she tell us whether she intends to continue her own personal fight against a single currency and an independent central bank when she leaves office? No, she's going to be the governor. On the present structure... <laughs> Prime Minister. What a good 
go to high jail. I had thought of it. But if I were, there'd be no European Central Bank accountable to no one, least of all to national parliament. Because the point of that kind of European Central Bank is no democracy taking powers away from every single parliament and being able to have a single currency and a monetary policy and an interest rate which takes all political power away from us. As my right honourable friend said in his first speech after the proposal of a single currency, a single currency is about the politics of Europe, it is about a federal Europe by the back door. So I'll consider the honourable gentleman's proposal. Now where were we? I'm enjoying this. I'm enjoying Now, in case you followed the Brexit issue and uh, how a significant segment of the British population feels towards Europe, you can see that these feelings have been there for a while and that uh, they came out uh, during the recent uh, Brexit vote. As for the single currency, this is not something I'll be discussing in this class. Okay, so uh, one last bout of comic relief. How many of you ever watched that show Parks and Recreation? Okay, so they have this character in there, Ron Swanson, who's supposed to be the archetypical neoliberal. So he works for the government, but he hates the government. So just three minutes of Swanson, and then we're back for, to serious stuff. Hello? Hello? Can I help you? My class is here on a field trip, and I'm supposed to interview someone for a school project. Okay. You can wait at that table, and someone will be here sometime. But aren't you here now? No. Look, little girl, can we postpone this for another day? It's unsettling having you just sit there. Well, my report's due tomorrow. What's it on? Why government matters. Really? It's never too early to learn that the government is a greedy piglet that suckles on a taxpayer's teat until they have sore, chapped nipples. I'm going to need a different metaphor to give this nine-year-old. What's your name, ma'am? Lauren Burkis. Lauren. My name is Ron Swanson, and I'm going to tell you everything you need to know about the miserable, screwed-up world of local government. You must in your mustache. Don't sass me, Burkus. Let's get started. Life, liberty, and property. It's John Locke. This is your lunch. Now, you should be able to do whatever you want to with this, right? If you want to eat all of it, great. If you want to throw it away in the garbage, that's your prerogative. But here I come, the government. And I get to take 40% of your lunch. And that, Lauren, is how taxes work. But that's not fair. You're learning. Uh-oh. Capital gains tax. That, Lauren, is how FDR ruined this country. Lauren, ready to head back? Well, I guess it's time for you to head home. I've really enjoyed talking with you. You are, and this is not a joke, much smarter than most of the people who work in this building. I like talking with you too, Mr. Swanson. Ron, hang on, hang on, I have something for you. This is a Claymore landmine. Use that to protect your property. Thanks, Ron. You got it. Are you Ron Swanson? I am. Okay, what exactly did you teach my daughter? Oh, uh, you must be Mrs. Burkus. Lauren was supposed to do a paper on why government matters. This is what she wrote. It doesn't. Well said. Is this a joke? No, ma'am. I legitimately believe that. I'm a libertarian. Oh, that's nice. Well, she is a fourth grader. And fourth graders aren't supposed to have their heads crammed full of weird ideas. They're supposed to do cute reports and get gold stars. I'm very sorry. I was only... And you ate her lunch? And you gave her a landmine? Really? Well, it seemed appropriate at the time. I... How? 
All I'm saying is keep an open mind for a while, listen to your teachers, and read all the books you can. Then when you're 18, you can drink, gamble, and become a libertarian. The drinking age is 21. I know. Another stupid government rule. So you'll write a new paper? Yeah. Can you autograph this one for me? Sure. Okay, so there are a number of clips online. Swanson has a huge following, as you can imagine. So, okay, now back to serious stuff. How many of you are familiar with the Berlin Wall? Any one of you was born before the Berlin Wall came down? No, you're all young, okay. So a uh, little bit of history, so uh, I will again show you another clip, real experts, well, real experts, more entertaining people. Hi, I'm Christina Hartman for About.com, and we're taking a look at the Berlin Wall. The Berlin Wall became a symbol of the Cold War and was seen as the ideological and physical barrier between the East and West. The wall was erected in 1961 and was brought down in 1989. After World War II, Germany was divided into four occupation zones, each controlled by a major occupying power within the country. France, England, the United States, and Soviet Russia each claimed a quarter of the country. And while the capital, Berlin, fell entirely in Soviet Russia's area, the city was also divided. Increased hostility between East and West, communism and democracy, led to several closures of routes between the Soviet section of the city and the rest. In August 1961, the border between East and West Berlin was closed by the East German Army, and the wall was erected. Originally constructed with barbed wire, the Berlin Wall evolved over its 28-year life into enormous concrete slabs and guard towers. There were guard dogs, searchlights, minefields, and bunkers used along the wall to prevent defections from East to West. An area of no man's land was left for soldiers to shoot Berliners attempting to escape. It's estimated that over 200 people were killed along the wall. By using tunnels, secret compartments and vehicles and other methods, around 5,000 people managed to defect to West Berlin. Certain checkpoints were set up, with the most famous being Checkpoint Charlie, although access between East and West had to be authorized and was restricted. For many Germans, the wall had immediate effects on everyday lives. Many Berliners had jobs in the western section of the city and were unable to keep them. Families were split and contacts severed. One of the most famous chapters during the Cold War was Ronald Reagan's challenge to Mikhail Gorbachev, the then leader of Soviet Russia at the Brandenburg Gate in 1987. Reagan challenged Gorbachev's comments about increased freedom and peace with the famous phrase, General Secretary Gorbachev, if you seek peace, if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, if you seek liberalization, come here to this gate, Mr. Gorbachev. Open this gate, Mr. Gorbachev. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. The fall of the Berlin Wall coincided with the regression of the Eastern Bloc. The Cold War was drawing to a close and communism declining in countries like Poland, Hungary, and Czechoslovakia, where many East Germans escaped through to get to the West. In early November 1989, an East German government official announced various checkpoints were being opened between East and West. Picked up by Western media, the news reached East Berliners who overwhelmed guards along the wall and made their way through. Eastern and Western Berliners were unified and scaled the walls and celebrated. In the ensuing weeks, the Berlin Wall was torn down. Segments of the wall remain in the city and in museums all over the world. East and West Germany became a single German state in October 1990. Thanks for watching our overview of the Berlin Wall. For more information, go to about.com. Hi, I'm Christina Hartman for About.com. Okay, so if you will forgive me the bad pun, uh, <coughs> the Berlin Wall came to represent a, con a concrete divide between two competing ideologies. On the one hand, the view that said that government knew better, top-down planning was the way to go, on the other, uh, people who said that the individual should have more freedom. Okay, so with this out of the way, how should we view the role of government in our society today? What do we want government to do? What is government about? And what can 
historical experience teach us in terms of what it can do and things that it perhaps doesn't do so well. So as the author points out, obviously, uh, we live in a free society, in a mostly free society, but there are many things that you cannot do, and that's the example I use all the time, but buying alcohol in Ontario is more difficult than in most other jurisdictions. Uh, you've got mono government monopolies or quasi-monopoly or private sector monopoly in terms of selling alcohol, and so in many ways, um, this is one of the most visible thing uh, that the government uh, does in Ontario. But uh, if you want to uh, drive a car, as you know, you've got to have a government-issued license. If you want to buy property, uh, you've got uh, all sorts of rules to follow to make sure that your property is up to code, uh, respect the local zoning. And so the government influences all aspects of our lives, uh, in some places more than in others. But it's also a big sector in the economy in terms of jobs uh, and expenditures. So I assume that most of you uh, went through a uh, public high school, for example. There are private high schools in this province, but they still have to follow uh, government norms in terms of the content that they teach and uh, in terms of what you're expected to learn and in terms of what they pay their teachers or the conditions uh, that you find in those schools, the buildings and other things. So obviously, most government jobs typically tend to be in the education and health sectors, but there are many other uh, government jobs at the local, provincial, and federal level. So the line between the public and the private sector is often blurred. So uh, in Canada, we've got a number of government-run uh, hospitals. I mean, our whole system is based on the government uh, running the hospitals. In many other countries, most hospitals are private, for example. Uh, in some places, uh, schools are, are free to do exactly what they want. They don't follow any government norm, but they don't get any support. In others, well, the schools are, again, uh, run by the government. They follow a strict curriculum. In other cases, you can have a private school that gets some subsidies from the government, but in return, it must follow uh, the government curriculum. So uh, the proper role of government has been debated uh, throughout history, especially in the last two centuries. It sort of culminated during uh, what was known as the Cold War in the 20th century. So you had people who believed in central planning on the one hand, people who believed in more freedom on the other. Uh, and all this came down with the fall of the Berlin Wall and with China uh, still being a communist uh, country in name. But if you look at uh, businesses practices there in many ways. Uh, they've become a market economy, at least for large sectors of their economies. So within that context, you can expect a question on uh, the traditional definition of what government is about. So governments are institutions with authority over laws and mandated territories. So uh, the notion of territory is always essential. You cannot have a government without having a specified piece of land over which it rules, so borders. And again, if you follow US politics, you know how borders matter to some people. But uh, you can have different forms of governments um, depending on the size of the country, the political tradition, the political ideology that is dominant. So you have uh, some countries, France would be one example, uh, where the central government has a lot of power. And then you've got other countries like Switzerland, for example, or to a lesser extent, the United States, uh, where the central government does not matter all that much, well, although this is less and less true in the United States, obviously, but in a place like Switzerland, most decisions are made at the local level. So uh, lower levels of governments have a lot more say in terms of how people live their lives than the central government, whereas in France, uh, in my experience, you know, you might be at a university uh, far from Paris, but everything has to be run through uh, the Paris office anyway even though the university might theoretically be independent. So national governments have the most power domestically and they tend to shape the mandates of international governments. So the federal government in this country is obviously the one in Ottawa. Uh, Canada is still relatively decentralized compared to many other countries. Uh, that's because historically uh, provinces, especially Quebec, were uh, reluctant to let the government, uh, the central government, have too much of a say outside of a few issues like national defense and uh, interprovincial trade, but in many ways, uh, Canada is still fairly decentralized compared to many other countries. So, in terms of money and bank, uh, 
we use less and less paper money, but uh, government still regulates uh, the banking system and the money supply. So this might come as a shock to you, but if you had lived in Canada two centuries ago, uh, the paper money you would have had in your pocket would have been emitted by banks, not by the government. So I did not include any illustration here, but at one point, uh, Molson, which uh, was a brewer at the time, but also on banks in Montreal, uh, the Molson Bank was emitting its own currency and people were transacting using paper money emitted by private banks. Uh, the government only got involved into monopolizing the money supply uh, much later on. So the model that emerged after that uh, were models in which uh, central banks are uh, run from the national capital. They are in theory independent from political interference. In practice, uh, there is a chairman of the Federal Reserve Board in the United States who was on the record as saying, well, I'm independent as long as I do what the president wants me to do. So again, in theory, they're independent. In practice, uh, they often get their cues from politicians. Uh, national banks are typically responsible for monetary policy. Now, this is something your generation might have a tough time to understand because ever since you were born, interest rates have been very low. Uh, if you place money at a bank, you're lucky if they give you a 1% or 2% on, uh, your, uh, on the amount that uh, you will uh, deposit there. But uh, when I was a kid, at one point, interest rates uh, were up to 20%, which was great if you had a lot of savings, but if you were paying a mortgage, uh, that was another issue. So governments are also responsible for fiscal policy, which is how much you pay in terms of uh, taxation. And banks are often regulated in terms of how much they loan in relation to how much uh, they, uh, they own as assets. So a number of people will tell you, for example, that Canadian banks did not get into the kind of practices that American banks did that led to a housing collapse because the criteria that they had to follow in Canada were much uh, stricter than in the United States. The reality is, I believe, a bit more complex, but still, national regulations do matter uh, between country in terms of your banking system. Okay, so there's the theory of the pure free market, supply and demand, people engage in voluntary transactions. Um, it's not like the government needs to be involved in terms of manufacturing cars. If you look at it historically, uh, Henry Ford did not wait for the government to mandate someone uh, to invent a car to do it. But in most economies, the government does intervene and does mandate things from the private sector or does tax money from citizens. And this is done on a few grounds. So the authors identify uh, three broad principles and you can expect a question on that. This is what I will expect as an answer. The first is to promote market efficiency, so to make sure that there is a level playing field, that the laws are clear, that the property rights are clearly established, that uh, the national economy is stable, uh, that uh, trade rules are enforced. And so in that case, the government is the referee, if you will, between the various players that are active in the private sector. But the government typically intervenes in the economies in the name of social priorities. So it is believed, for example, that if the government was not taxing citizens to fund education, that less people would go to school, or would poor people go to school if there wasn't a playing field and government taxing people who have more means to provide the means to people of lesser means to get an education. Uh, the same is true for health and social programs. And if you believe that inequality is bad, uh, some uh, level of uh, wealth distribution is socially desirable, well, the government can tax people who have more money and redistribute it to people who have less. Another standard argument is the one of public goods. So in short here, the argument is that the private sector will always provide goods for which people are willing to pay. But in some circumstances, either people don't have the money to pay or else there are things that are desirable, but because it's kind of hard to get people to pay, you don't get uh, things uh, produced and delivered by the private sector. So something like a national park, for example, uh, promoting uh, a certain uh, quality of life, uh, roads, schools, uh, security. I mean, if you have money, you can live well anywhere. 
if you don't have money, some places you view it as being better than others. And so again, the government in that case is viewed as someone that levels the playing fields and will provide things that people value, but which the private sector will not provide because either people are not willing to pay for them or because it's just too difficult to get them to pay for something. Okay, you know I like figures. Make a note, figure 6.1. You can expect a question on this. So the point here in terms of economic strategy from the government is in theory to strike a balance between tapping the markets for what they're good at, at the same time uh, targeting social priorities that you cannot necessarily expect the market to deliver, and uh, providing public goods which, again, uh, the private sector might not uh, be all that good at delivering. So if you want the efficiency of the market, if you believe that competition is a good thing, well, you want freedom of exchange, you want property rights, you want stability, you want to know that if you buy a house or if you invest uh, in a factory that it will still be yours in 20 years from now unless you go bankrupt or unless you want to sell it to somebody else. Um, now, your life might be good, but there might be a high unemployment rate in society, so if uh, the government believes it can do better than it justifies its intervention, its intervention that way. So considerations like employment, equity and externalities, especially environmental problems. And public goods here in that case are a bit more concrete, so infrastructure, services, health, education, and defense and police. So again, this is why the government can legitimize its intervention in the economy essentially to compensate for things that the private sector is not good at delivering or to correct social outcomes which are viewed as being unequal or unfair. Now what are public goods in relation to uh, other goods? Make a note for table 6.1. So excludable versus non-excludable, rivalrous and non-rivalrous. So we've got pure private goods. Again, if I wanted to steal your laptop or if I wanted to confiscate your laptop, you could go to campus security and make a good case against me. You paid for it, it's yours, I have no right to take it from you. So in that case, it's a pure private good. We know who the laptop belongs to and you know that you, I cannot take it from you without either paying you for it or coming up with a very good rationale, which I don't know what it would be. Uh, common pool resources. So we've already discussed uh, some of those in a previous lecture. So inshore fisheries. So again, I keep uh, getting back to uh, uh, lobster gangs in New England. So again, there's a coastline, there are lobsters. Local fishermen will <coughs> determine among themselves who gets to fish or who gets to trap lobsters in certain parts of the coast. Now, in terms of non-rivalrous good, you've got uh, club goods, so toll roads, theater, golf clubs. So some roads you've got to pay. I, I assume that uh, most of you have been on the 407 at some point. Uh, nobody will prevent you from getting on it, but if you don't pay the bill that is sent your way, uh, then you'll be in trouble. And then there are pure public goods and commons, so road networks, public education, the atmosphere, uh, offshore fisheries and things like that. Okay, now historically governments have intervened for a number of uh, reasons. Again, this is something that people your age have a tough time to understand, but at one point in time there was no internet, at one point in time there was no television, at one point in time all you had was radio. Now radio stations were at first uh, private in most places, but in the 1930s the Canadian government thought it wise to create something that came to be known as the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation because it was believed that uh, private stations would either uh, cater only to the lowest common denominator or else that people would listen mostly to American stations. And in that context, it was viewed as detrimental to Canadian unity and the building of a nation and to building of a, a sense of what it is to be Canadian. And so the CBC has been around for several decades. Um, I don't know how many of you visit their websites or actually watch uh, what they produce. But the rationale historically was in that case that the private sector would not contribute to the education of the general public. Uh, they would produce the equivalent of, I don't know, the Kardashian family or something. 
and that the creation of the CBC was justified to both educate the public and create something of a Canadian consciousness. Okay, now in terms of national economic strategies, uh, there were various degrees of government intervention in the past. Um, I will ask you to uh, remember and differentiate uh, between these. So statism is usually described, and that's the way they do it, the, that's the way they present it in the textbook, as uh, top-down priorities established by national government. So I have, a whole I have a couple of lectures on central planning in another course. I'm not gonna go uh, into too much detail here, but typically the idea is that you've got experts who know better than other people, and because they're more educated or because they have the broader interest of society at heart, they should be put in charge and they will tell other people uh, what should be produced, what priorities should be, and how scarce resources should be allocated among uh, different people. Now another model historically, that's a word uh, you hear a lot today, fascism. Um, it seems to me that fascism today means anyone I disagree with, but that's not exactly what it meant in the past. Um, as it emerged in the 1920s in places like Italy, uh, fascism was a form of corporatism in which the state became the most important uh, unit in life. But the state was essentially a place where various interests would bargain uh, with each other and would reach a consensus. So you would have large industries, you would have unions, you would have uh, representative of the political uh, power and priorities would be determined that way, and the idea was that everybody would push in the same direction, but there would be a form of consultation. Mm -hmm. But as is often the case, uh, the people with the biggest sticks typically created the consensus, and this is how uh, things went. Now, another form of intervention was the welfare state, in which um, people were taxed, but the bargain here was that the government would take care of people from cradle to grave. So you would have public education, public health care, uh, public goods being provided by the government. And so the welfare state was a democracy, but where people were in theory free to say what they wanted, where there was no collective goal, but there was a high level of government intervention to take care of the needs of people. Now, the neoliberal state, which is what the first video was about, and I have a number of issues with what was in there, but that's kind of the view of most of my colleagues, which is why I presented it to you. Uh, the market sector decides priorities, and it's highly critical of government intervention. So if it doesn't pay, it probably should not exist. Uh, who cares if people don't care about Shakespeare and they would rather watch the Kardashians? It should be their decision. The development state, uh, well, it's believed that uh, private businesses only think about themselves, but that the government, because it cares about the territory that it manages, because the people who run it are less selfish, that the government can actually intervene in the economy and deliver policies that will be better than voluntary transaction motivated by greed and selfishness. So again, all these things kind of overlap, but this is how the authors present uh, various uh, national economic strategies, and this is what I will expect you uh, to remember. Okay, the neoliberal state, so uh, one of the emblematic figure of the neoliberal state was Margaret Thatcher, whom you got to meet if you were not already familiar with her. So uh, she comes into power in the 1970s after a few decades of the welfare state, and the problem in Britain at the time is that uh, the government is running out of money, everybody's going on strike, and what uh, she and her government say is that, well, we've gone too far, we should give more freedom back to the people, and people should be responsible for making their own decisions. And yes, you might have more inequality, but as she argues, if you remember the thing, yes, you might have more equality, but the poor will be richer than the situation that you had before when you had less inequality, but everybody the poor were actually poorer. So do you care about the absolute uh, standard of living of poor people, or do you care about inequality in society? So uh, this has sort of become famous since then, since but we should see, uh, use that thing in the British House of Commons, and that's the kind of fundamental value of neoliberal societies. Do you care more about freedom 
and absolute standards of living, or do you value uh, equality as being, for example, uh, less likely to create social problems and social discontent? So the idea of the neoliberal policies was to deregulate, uh, privatize. So if we were to privatize the LCBO, for example, any one of you could start uh, a business selling alcohol if you wanted to. So I don't know how many of you are in the management faculty, but we had uh, one of the dragons, I see we, because I've been delegated to the management uh, school this year. We had one of the dragons last uh, fall, uh, you know, uh, Indian woman from Calgary who was, in, who was into the wine and spirits, and that's a business that her father started when the Alberta government decided to privatize their liquor board. So once the government gets out of the business of selling alcohol, well, a number of people stepped in and began to sell alcohol. Now, in the case of alcohol, uh, it was not nationalized because it was viewed as an essential service, but it was essentially to keep a vice uh, under control. So in that case, the idea is that, well, people will have their vice, but they'll probably be better served if you have a number of people competing with each other, selling booze, than having the government uh, trying to um, do that. Okay, so the rationales for neoliberal policies are related to reducing bureaucracy and maximizing freedom of choice by consumers and producers. The critiques of neoliberals are essentially the, the don't use any new arguments. They're the arguments that were made in the past to justify the welfare state. Uh, governments will go into booms and bust. Uh, there'll be market failures, and the market will not provide things like uh, education and health care for poor people. So again, there's always a balance between these two. There are these two opposites, and the political pendulum tend to swing over time. Now, what the authors tell you is that while in theory, uh, economies like the United States are a uh, free market, the state will intervene in many ways, except that historically in the United States, instead of having a formal national policy, what you would have would be a large defense sector, and what politicians would do is that they would allocate uh, contracts to build tanks, airplanes, or machine guns, or whatever, to various parts of the United States, and that's how they would actually spread economic activity as opposed to doing it in some other ways. In contemporary times, if you've been following uh, the uh, US uh, election, Donald Trump, in a way, even though he's presented as a fascist, well, in that case, it's kind of right because fascists wanted more government intervention. Um, he wants to uh, impose taxes on goods from Mexico, so he wants a tariff. He was willing or he supported a policy to give subsidies to a business in Indiana to retain jobs there. And he wants to, he approved the Keystone XL pipeline, or at least he had an executive order to do that. But the steel to build a pipeline must be American steel. So in a way, uh, Trump, even though he's presented as a right winger, is somebody who really does not believe in neoliberal policies. He wants to have a strong and approach to intervening in the economy. Okay, uh, but the standard critique is that the government cannot pick winners. Uh, if it was so easy to, there's nothing in the head of bureaucrats or in the files that land in their computers that is knowledge that is not already available to people who work in the private sector. So if you're an investor and you want to invest in a promising business, uh, well, most of the time you'll fail because most businesses fail, but there's nothing that bureaucrats and government people know that people in the private sector who manage their own money don't know already. So it's not like the government can pick winners any better than people who devote their lives to investing in businesses in the private sector. Okay, in terms of revenue generation, well, uh, governments are involved uh, in all uh, economies the world over, but in some places more than others. So historically, Japan and the United States had relatively lower levels of government interventions, although this began to change in Japan in the 1990s. And uh, under uh, Obama in the United States, the government began to intervene. I mean, to be fair, under Bush before, and the amount of government spending began to increase uh, significantly. Now in Europe, uh, government intervention has been significant for a much longer period of time. Um, 
there are also various ways in which government finance themselves. Um, in places like Canada and the US, you've got corporate and personal income taxes, but the price of the goods that you buy tend to be cheaper, for example, than in Europe, and that's because in Europe, historically, taxation levels on goods and services that you purchase have been much higher than in North America. So total tax revenue as a percentage of GDP, so this is from a few years ago, so uh, again, it varies. Australia about a quarter, 26%, Austria 42, uh, France 44, Denmark 47, Mexico 19, Netherlands 38, uh, United States 24, and Canada is at 30. So you can see that some countries were lower than us, not that many. So South Korea, uh, Japan, the United States, but many countries add more total tax revenues as percentage of GDP than Canada. So taxes are high here because, or at least we think, because we can always compare ourselves to the United States, but compared to many other countries in the world, uh, the tax burden, uh, while high, is not at the level that you find it at many other countries. Uh, Canadian gov federal government revenue sources a decade ago and more recently, so a lot of it came from uh, personal income tax. So this is what you will pay if you add a job to the federal government uh, shortly, if you haven't done so already. Uh, the GST, uh, corporate income tax, tariffs are still, so, are still not insignificant, employment insurance premiums, and other revenues. Um, government has various assets, can earn money in various ways. Uh, okay, I'll skip that. It's too boring. Okay, spending. Uh, Governments spend on all sorts of things. They typically do that through people who are employed by the government. Uh, they might work for department, agencies, school, hospitals, what have you. And uh, in countries when governments spend a lot, capital cities are typically doing well. So some of the cities in which you've got uh, better standards of living in this country are places like Ottawa and Quebec City. You've got a stable employment base, uh, You've got people whose job is secure. Government tends to hire more people over time, even though they might let, let a few of them go at some points in time. But uh, maybe some of you have had that experience. I lived in Ottawa in the early 1990s, and the one thing that always, well, it's not amazed me, but something I would notice in the morning is that, you know, it's getting close to 9 o'clock. It seems to me in Toronto, everybody rushes to go to work. In Ottawa, let's say, pe most people had a much more leisurely pace, at least in my experience. So uh, federal countries, state and provinces have their own bureaucracies and spending powers. So I'm from Quebec, where in Quebec you don't have to file one, but actually two tax forms, one for the federal government, one for the Quebec government. In most other jurisdictions in this country, you file it to the federal government, will then transfer money to the provinces, but in Quebec, historically, it was always a point of, uh, well, just a negotiation with the federal government that the provincial government would run its own revenue agency, not to be dependent on the federal government. Uh, governments are typically big employers, uh, and big structures come with big administration costs. Uh, what most people tend to forget, though, is that local governments, things like the city of Mississauga, tend to be the biggest government employer, and Across Canada, it's probably still the case that uh, municipal employees actually earn more than federal and provincial employees with similar levels of responsibility. So if you think that working for the um, Canadian or Quebec government is good, well, the best gig you could get in uh, Quebec was actually working for the city of Montreal. They were paid a lot more and perhaps not asked to do as much. Sorry, just frustrated Montrealer here. So. Um, but uh, a different rationale came for uh, the um, for justified government intervention in the economy in the 1930s. The 1930s is the time of the Great Depression in the United States. Uh, things are not going well in Europe. You have the rise of Hitler, the real Hitler, in the 1930s, and in an attempt to try to stimulate the economy at the time, a number of politicians. Uh, listen to this fellow here, John Maynard Keynes, a British economist, who essentially created modern macroeconomics. 
So it used to be that up until the early years, early decades of the 20th century, if you were uh, taking an economics course, you would only learn the uh, microeconomic sequence. So why do people behave the way they do, supply, demand, prices, these kinds of things. And Keynes come along and creates uh, the foundations of what becomes modern macroeconomics, which is a sort of looking at the economy as a whole and things interacting uh, with each other at a level beyond the individual. So if you hated macroeconomics, or if you liked it, you have got to thanks or curse uh, John Maynard Keynes. So macroeconomic policies focuses on aggregate performances. So you look at big aggregates like consumption, investment, output, total employment. And the general idea of Keynes, and this is really what I will ask you to remember, and this is not in the margins of the textbook, so please pay attention. If I ask you what are the two big insights of John Maynard Keynes or what government should do, basically what he argues is that government should be an active player in the following sense. When the economy is not doing too well, the government should borrow and spend. You know, you build bridges, you build roads, uh, you hire people in the government, you sort of pump cash in back into the economy, and so you create deficits. But when the economy is good, then you step back, you begin to pay your debt, you begin to generate surpluses, and you even things out in the long run. So you should stimulate the economies in times of recession, and you should cool them down in terms of boom time, or at least the government should be uh, less active and should try to balance its budget. Now, whether or not you agree with this prescription, I think the historical record shows rather clearly that governments or politicians like to spend, like to borrow and spend and give people uh, stuff. When the going is good, Cutting government expenditures, balancing the budget has proven somewhat more difficult. So there's the theory and then there's, there are political incentives and the way most politicians have behaved in democracies over the last few decades. Okay, but again, this is really what I want. Fiscal policies are used that government should stimulate economies in recession and cool them down. Okay, now we're finally getting to the economic geography section of that chapter. So, so far the authors have laid down the traditional case that some of you might have learned in other economic uh, courses. But as far as regional development, economic geography, national economies are concerned, one thing you should remember is that all politics is local. And if you remember the maps that I showed you earlier this semester, economic development has never occurred evenly over geographical space. Economic development has historically always been concentrated in a few cities. And so things were no different in the United States, the United Kingdom, France, and other places. So some regions in the United States, the greater New York area, Chicago, Boston, St. Louis, and later on Los Angeles, San Francisco, these regions were fairly prosperous and were doing well on their own. But obviously, politicians are elected not only in prosperous regions, but in less prosperous ones. And again, if you followed uh, the American election, you might now be familiar with uh, the Electoral College and the notion that Politics always tends to favor regions that are less populated and less developed. They tend to get proportionally more political representatives than more developed and more populous regions. Now, the Electoral College in the United States was designed specifically to make sure that a few regions would not dominate uh, the US political system. Things might be different in other regions, 
But in a country like Canada, well, you've got members of parliaments from all across the uh, territory. And a place like Prince Edward Island, for example, gets a lot more politicians in Ottawa in light of their population than Ontario does. And this is done on purpose to make sure that, again, regions that are less developed and less populated get more political representation. Well, what is the general effect of that on the political system? Well, in a system where you would have proportional representation, where people would vote for, I don't know, a party that wants to legalize marijuana, or that wants to ban abortion, or that wants to do other things, well, the region, geography, would not matter all that much because people would be voting on issues. But in the system that we have, re uh, less developed regions tend to get a lot more weight than their population typically warrants. So there's always been an incentive among politicians to cater to the needs of less advanced, less populous regions. And so because growth never occurs uniformly across any landscape, there's always been an incentive among the dominant political parties to spread the wealth from regions that have a lot of it, typically cities, metropolitan areas, to regions that have less of it but have more political representation. And so what the authors tell you is that in democracies, but also in the Soviet Union, to be uh, truth be told, policies that wanted to spread the wealth more evenly across the geographical landscape uh, proliferated in the uh, 1950s. Now, it's not like government bureaucracies knew how to run businesses better than people in the private sector, but what they have was more money and the capacity to vote legislations. So typically what they tried to do was to try to go see large businesses and essentially bribe them in locating plants in regions where they would not locate them on their own. So there's a reason why most businesses, if you let them decide where to invest, will tend to invest where most people and more well, most wealth is already is. Either they want to be close to consumers or else they want to be close to suppliers and to the infrastructure that you only find in more advanced uh, regions. So for a few decades, uh, politicians tried to, tried to bribe large businesses to open uh, branch plants in less advanced uh, regions, or else they artificially maintain businesses that were no longer competitive <coughs> in order to create local employment. So for example, coal mining in Cape Breton and Nova Scotia that should have died of its own inefficiency several decades ago, but in order to keep uh, uh, some local jobs available, the government essentially put them on an artificial respirator, government subsidies for several decades. Now, by the 1970s, most people realized that these policies were not extremely successful, that as soon as uh, government ran out of money and they no longer had subsidies, that firms would not stay in um, these regions, that firms were also trying to gain uh, to game the, uh, the way the game was played. So they tried to go into the uh, less developed regions, but as close as possible to the main uh, economic regions of the country. And so it was argued that these policies were um, a waste of taxpayers' money, and people like Margaret Thatcher came along and said, well, we're no longer going to subsidize the production of coal that does not pay for itself. So that was a typical neoliberal stance on uh, economic activities. And at the same time, a lot of people in more remote regions were tired of being told what to do by people based in Ottawa, Toronto, or Quebec City. So in Quebec, for example, you had people who were essentially charged to go in more rural areas and essentially shut down villages and concentrate people in a few regional centers. And uh, there was a lot of recrimination against that, but they say, well, we're gonna develop your region, you're gonna benefit from it, but we need to close down your village and you need to relocate. So obviously a lot of people didn't like that. So because of this, uh, these failures, there was a pushback to promote bottom-up approaches. So top-down, you've got people in Quebec City and Ottawa and Toronto who will tell people in remote regions what to do or else will try to incentivize people to go relocate there from Toronto to a more remote area. These things don't work all that well. 
And so partly because they gave up and partly because the old approaches have not worked, government will tend to support uh, what they call bottom-up uh, policies. So these will take the form of local economic development in which you want to promote local entrepreneurs and also strategies where you gather everybody together could be considered a mild form of fascism, even though it's not, and using the word in that context is not, is not really fair. But the idea is that you get people to talk together, to agree on objectives, and you sort of develop your region that way. The problem with those is that, what can governments do? Well, they can make money available to people, uh, things that the private sector, banks or others, uh, other investors would not invest. Uh, you can provide as advisory services to help people launch businesses. You can provide incubator facilities. But, you know, if you live in a small town somewhere, there's only so much you can do. So as someone who dabbled a bit in Quebec uh, regional development policy, you talk to people in your village, well, you know, what kind of new idea or new business can you launch? And in Quebec, everybody had the same idea. It was to create a local cheese. You live in a remote area, well, you can have cows, you can have goats, and you want to create a cheese that will be associated with your little village. I mean, it's nice if you have a few of them, but when most of your villagers come up with the notion of, you know, creating a local cheese, you can only go so far. And so these policies uh, can provide tools, uh, tools to people, they can give them an opportunity to voice their concern, but the sad truth is that, you know, if you're young and ambitious, you typically want to move to the city because you know that's where the opportunities are. And if you want to launch something that is other than cheese or, let's say, food related, it just makes more sense to move to Toronto than to stay in your remote area or to move to Montreal than to stay in your remote area. So um, at some point, it's young people who create the future. And when most young people have left, there's only so much that you can do. Uh, in your local area other than rely on a few government services and hope that you know the next Bill Gates is born in your city and creates his business there and basically revives Seattle on his own. So contemporary policies features now interactions between all level of governments but uh, I would argue that uh, the economic landscape is as unequal as it's ever been. There are such things as an economic rationale as to why economic activity occurs in certain places and not in others. Okay, public-private partnerships, I will go over that quickly. Um, basically what happened is that uh, governments ran out of money, private sectors wanted to get involved, and having the government as a customer is kind of the best customer you can have because you know it's not going to go bankrupt. So it's been a bit problematic. Uh, Public-private uh, partnership involves governments and private sector. It's now a widespread feature of uh, local development strategy. So in theory, you've got the, let's say, broader vision of the public sector with the greater efficiency of the private sector. In practice, there's often, there's often been a lot of collusions and when things go wrong, ultimately, the taxpayers who end up paying for them. I mean, uh, politicians are politicians. People who are there to make a buck who deal with politicians are in there for their own selfish interest. Can you blame them? Uh, things don't work, who ends up paying? Well, taxpayers, because the public was involved in the first place. Uh, if you build a baseball stadium and the government is in charge but subcontracts it and it ends up costing uh, billions of dollars, as in Montreal, whereas a very good structure could have been built for maybe 18% or 20% of the cost, well, who ends up paying it? Typically, it's the taxpayers. It's not the politicians. It's not the businesses who lose uh, or go bankrupt because they're not getting paid by their other private partner. Okay, plannings and regulations. So, we have urban plans that uh, allow you to build certain types of business in some parts of the city and not others. Urban planning is typically the responsibility of local governments. You've got community plan and zoning. Uh, these things are complex. Uh, try to open a business in your basement if you live on a quiet suburban street, if you don't have any parking spots, if you, your neighbors don't want the stuff to be there. Uh, these things can be problematic. But urban planning is justified, and I will ask you to remember these three things here, and I don't believe that they are in the margins either. Urban planning, in theory, seeks to reduce negative externalities among land use. So the joke was that um, 
well, in the past it was, well, you don't want a house next to a glue factory. Later on it became, you don't want a church next to a bar where all sorts of bad things happen. Uh, you want to promote positive externality, so you want some scenic beauty. You might want a green belt, for example, uh, which a private sector might not give you. And you want to ensure a supply of public goods, again, uh, parks available to everyone, which is, again, not something that the private sector uh, might provide because uh, parks occupy valuable real estate and people don't pay for them. Although this is not true, I've been to a park in Tokyo in the middle of the city, which is very beautiful and very quiet, but you need to pay if you want to enter, and the whole park is gated. Okay, so the rationale for urban planning, this is what I want. Figure 6.2, remember it all? No, I won't ask you. But the process here is kind of a summary of what the authors have described in terms of planning. Okay, bear with me a few more slides on free trade and I'll let you go. Now, free trade was something that was taken for granted these last few decades in the 1990s. Politicians on the left uh, in the United States and Great Britain, uh, B.D. Labor or B.D. Bill Clinton when he was president, they came from the left side of the political spectrum, but they had bought into the notion that free trade was overall good for everyone. Uh, yes, people might lose their jobs, but better jobs would be created in the process. So there might be a process of people finding new work, but overall more work uh, would be created. Now, obviously with uh, the Trump presidency in the United States, uh, the theoretical case for free trade is much less popular now than it was uh, 25 years ago. But the free trade agenda, which is this notion of getting rid of barriers to trade between countries, relates to uh, goods that are visible. So you know you might want to import a laptop from another country, a smartphone, what have you. Uh, services, if you want to deal uh, with the banking sector in other countries, if you want to buy financial products in other countries, you might be able to do so. Foreign direct investment, the free movement of people between countries, and increasingly, and this is what uh, the TPP was about, but it seems dead, so we're not going to spend any time on this, uh, intellectual property rights. So things that were developed that's in the United States, but that are copied without compensation in places like China. So historically, what free trade policies as they were implemented by politicians who believed in them, who delegated those tasks to people whose job it was to negotiate the removal of barriers between country, was about eliminating taxes on goods that move between countries, so these are known as tariffs, but also non-tariff barriers, um, which is all the ways by which uh, governments in certain countries prevented the imports of goods from other countries, beating, limiting the number of Japanese cars that could enter the United States, or making sure that uh, you know you took a year to inspect cheeses in a warehouse and no cheese would survive that. I mean, kind of exaggerating here, but there were various ways to block imports from entering your countries. So you had something called the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, which was created in the uh, post-World War II era, which became the World Trade Organization about two decades ago, which were negotiating rounds between countries whose goal was to facilitate the movement of goods and people uh, between countries. Um, so removing taxes on goods was easy. Everything else was kind of tricky, especially when you dealt with agriculture and intellectual properties. Um, again, I've been teaching that stuff for years. I swear to you, I never saw something like Donald Trump coming and challenging the case for free trade. So uh, I'm gonna go quickly over this and I'll revise my notes in my other course. But uh, the case for free trade today is much less accepted than it was a few years ago when perhaps this is something that should be revisited in more detail, but it is not in this textbook and I won't do it here. Okay, trade disputes, long story short, there's no United Nations armies that enforces agreements. So typically the way things work is that when country is accused of not living up to what it assigned to, the other country is allowed to retaliate against it 
by also imposing barriers to trade. And that's one of the main problems with free trade agreements. There's no general authority that can actually enforce a decision. So you go to court here, somebody accuses you of something, you're found guilty, you either go to jail, you pay a fine, but if you decide I'm not gonna do that, well, it's not because you don't wanna conform to a court's decision that you won't go to jail, for example. But if a country does not live up to what it had signed in a trade agreement, the only thing that can happen is that a country that complains is allowed to retaliate against it. That's all it can do. And it's always been the problem with uh, trade dispute mechanisms. So there are a number of those. They discuss them in the uh, textbook. So countries belong to both local trade agreements and belong to broader organizations. Um, externality, governance, environmental issues. Yeah. So conclusion, different levels of government exercise pervasive influence over use of space. National governments remain pivotal, but their role has changed in recent decades. And the role of government obviously varies among society, and I suspect this is something that you will be discussing as old people, because again, you've got long-standing position for and against government, and the political pendulum tend to swing over time. Okay, I still have a number of uh, booklets. Uh, two weeks to complain formally. If you've done so already, give me your booklets. You'll get them back next week. Other than that, I have office hours. You can talk to me here until five o'clock. And after that, I'll be in my geography office, not the Kenneth one. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm.